This is Profit from the Inside with Joel Block. Insights to give your business the inside track. And now, here's your host, Joel Block. Is owning the means of production important anymore? Well, business models are blowing up, business is blowing up, some in a good way, some not so good. And here to share insights on all of these critical topics, Mark Smith. Mark, how are you, man? I'm so great, Joel. Delight to be on your podcast. You're a hero of mine, been on my podcast twice. Yeah. And I yeah. consider for you to be my money wizard. <laughs> I come to you to learn everything there is to be known about money, and I'm delighted to contribute to your podcast. Well, listen, I, I, I saw a program that you did recently uh, on uh, changing business models, especially as it relates to IT, and it was such a bullseye for me. It really uh, was so accurate. I, I wanted to discuss those points uh, right now because uh, there's a lot of misconception. And, it, and it's not misconception as much as it is uh, old school. And sometimes old school uh, needs changing and sometimes old school keeps working. So let's talk about the uh, first question is, uh, we all learned early on, you got to own the means of production. Very That's important. exactly right. As a baby boomer, all your stuff. So where are we with that? Right. As a baby boomer, you and I were taught you've got to own the means of production if you're going to run your business. And when I joined Hewlett Packard in 1982 as a fresh, min, freshly minted engineer out of college, HP did everything in that factory off of the Garden of the Gods Road in Colorado Springs. They pulled wire. They coated wire. They bent metal. They plated metal. They shot the knobs. Everything was built within that facility. Of course, fast forward to today, there ain't nothing in that facility. It is a ghost town. There is some engineering, a little bit of marketing, and nothing else. Everything well, has been outsourced. Listen, so I, I guess it must have cost something to pull all that wire, huh? It, it did. It cost something. And the time, they believed that was the only way they could control the quality. Well, at that time, it probably was. It was. And since then, what we have transitioned to is from an age of ownership, where we own the means of production, we've shifted to the, meet, to the age of access, where we lease or rent or subscribe to the means of production. Now, think about this. Apple, number one top company on the planet in terms of non-oil revenue, right? <laughs> let's, yeah. let's separate the oil revenue from the people that make stuff. Apple's number one on the list. They don't make anything other than intellectual property. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Just intellectual property. They, sell, they go to Foxconn to do all the building. All the manufacturing is not done by Apple people. It's done by other people because that's yeah. how you scale. It's how you let others be experts at what they do so you can be an expert at what you do. And the end result, of course, is the profitability of Apple is just off the chart. Well, everybody's moving to that. Well, you know, listen, one of the things you know I say is that money follows expertise. Right on. And, and so it kind of takes what, what that whole concept's about to another level, which is do what you're great at, do it great, get other people doing what they're great at, let them do great, pay them for what they're great at, and there's going to be a lot more juice left over as a result. Great. So, so true. True. Absolutely true. Because quite frankly, manufacturers don't have the capacity to keep up with the changes in the technology if they're only focused on a single product line. Even a company as massive as Apple selling 78 million iPhone 10s, and people are saying, oh, the iPhone 10's not going anywhere. 78 million's not nowhere, folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I guess it's all relative, you know. I mean, there's, uh, you know, the curve is is not the the, the steepness that they need. So, but yeah, so that, tell that, us that, tell that, us a little more. So, all right. So uh, the the whole but, idea so here. So here's the thing. So listen. Yeah. So this whole concept, this whole discussion, uh, the business model of business is changing. Yes. And there are hundreds of different kinds of business models. Uh, you know, there's different ways of skinning the cat in, in every different way. So what exactly is changing? Where is it changing? Let's take a look and let's get, uh, get a little deeper. You bet. Well, the thing that's really important is that all business is determined by business models. Your success is determined on the business models. And business models have changed over time radically. And one business model was own the means of production. And what yeah. we're shifting to is the, the business model of, of rent everything, lease everything, subscribe to everything. And this really gets back to the fundamental concept of that all business models are driven by the source of funds. This is a really important concept. Yeah. The source of funds determines your business model. 
So your business model is going to be different if the money comes from Wall Street. It's going to be different if it comes from an investor. It's going to be different if it comes from a VC. It's going to be different if it comes out of your pocket. It's going to be different if it comes from tax dollars. It's going to be different if it comes from tuition. All determined by where that money comes from. Well, listen, so the the simplest one for uh, people who own their own businesses, we'll we'll talk about corporate in a second, but the simplest one for people who own their own business to understand is when it's financed by yourself. Right on. Uh, You might have a spouse that has an opinion about how you spend your money. You you might have, uh, you know, family members that have an opinion. You might have partners that have an opinion. And and your business model might just be a compromise of a whole bunch of things and it ends up in the big mush pot. That's exactly right. And that's a real challenge. So... So choosing how you're going to fund yourself is really an important component of building your business and creating a business model that works. And today, the business model that is most in play are those that are influenced by Wall Street. And Wall Street today rewards a dollar of transactional revenue differently than a dollar of subscription revenue. Yeah, so that's, that's, listen, this, this is a giant concept. Keep going. It's huge. Absolutely huge. So if you're business generates a dollar of transactional revenue, Wall Street will reward you with a valuation of X, X being determined by the niche that you're in. If it's yeah. tech, you know, it might be 25X. And if it's banking, it might be a fraction of that. <laughs> right, five, but, yeah. Right, exactly. But if that same dollar is a subscription dollar, Wall Street will reward you from six to 10 times the same transactional dollar. And as you taught yeah. me a long time ago, a dollar is not a dollar. There's no, it's various not. flavors of dollars. Yes, there are. And of course, if you're, if you're Amazon.com, Wall Street will reward you with a 250x multiplier. Well, so let's, so let's take a look at some examples. So Microsoft for years sold software. They don't even sell software. If you go online, you can't even get Office online anymore. They, uh, exactly they sell right. this uh, 365 subscription product for 100 bucks a year. That's exactly they right. They sell the software for, I don't know, sometimes it was 1,000, sometimes it was 500, sometimes it came down to 100 bucks. Now they get a hundred bucks a year. That's right. QuickBooks is trying to do the same thing. Every one of the software companies is doing the same thing. Adobe Absolutely. doesn't sell their software anymore. It's all being sold. Uh, it's all rented. Because, yeah, I, because yeah, Wall Street likes that. That's exactly, they love it. They absolutely love it. And the reason why is because it provides stability of income. There is right. not much variation from month to month in the money that's coming in. That's right. And of yeah. course, what kills Wall Street are these hockey stick effects where you know the first two months of the quarter, you get nothing. And the last month, you get a lot of good stuff, but you have no idea. And you're sitting, you know, just chewing your nails, hoping. So this levels out all of that. Well, here's an interesting component is that because Wall Street is making this pivot, a big piece of the growth of Wall Street's valuation is the shifting up of the valuations. And a lot of people look at this and say, it's a bubble. It's a bubble. No, it's not. Yeah. We actually have new levels of value because of the consistency of cash flow we didn't have before. And if you take a look at this, this thing we were just talking about, that subscription and revenue is worth six to 10 X. That means that Wall Street should really be six to 10 X where it was before we started doing this. And so well, keep, keep in mind though, that uh, the transition happens slowly. Not all companies are fully converted. It's uh, it's a process. But well, this is something that the stock pundits aren't really talking about. They're not really talking about the underlying fundamentals. They're not. And, and I talk about this a lot. You and I talk about this a lot. Right on. That there are reasons that the underlying fundamentals are strong. Uh, yeah, listen, the, a couple of weeks ago, we had a setback. It doesn't matter. That setback was nothing. I mean, there were yeah, practically- that, that was not a setback. setback. That was profit-taking, and yeah. the suckers jumped out. Well, and those I mean, listen, it, it's, it's reasonable. You take uh, five steps forward, a step back, five forward, a step back. And it, that's, that's how life is. And so we're, uh, right we're dealing with that. That's how we make money. And, and, and it'll, it comes roaring back because of these things we're talking about. Yeah. So the, the thing that is important to understand is as we make this pivot to subscription revenues and subscription income, every CEO who is tasked with maximizing shareholder value is going to make that pivot to a subscription model. And that's well, listen, they, they're investment bankers. If they're public companies, the investment bankers are all telling them, this is what you need to do to maximize your value. The CFOs are all going to training classes that tell them how to maximize their value. They're all taking the same classes. Everybody's going in the same direction. And that's how we learn. And we learn from each other. Then people watch a podcast like this and they say, hey, listen, that's how Wall Street's doing it. So bigger companies, medium-sized companies, it trickles down into uh, – different sectors of the market. 
And, and those of us that are kind of out there with, with the, uh, the players are, are kind of understanding it. And that's the value we bring is by sharing this insight with, uh, with folks. And, you know, when I share with corporate audiences, I mean, I talk about it. I saw you talk about it on stage. I mean, that's what we do, right? That's right. That's what we do. We help people see things in a new way that's more profitable. The good news is that if you can make this pivot and create a subscription style model, you can make enormous amounts of money a whole lot easier because the first of the month, your net's covered. Yeah. You don't have to go out and hustle another deal. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, stop hustling gigs, right? Right on. That's it. It's right so, in your business model that you and I believe in completely. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's talk of- now about, uh, so you got, you got this changing business model. A new business model means new business rules. It is. Let's talk about that. You know I love business rules. I mean, right business, uh, business rules are the way that, you know, you tell people you want to operate and you have every right to tell them how you want to operate. And they, of course, have every right to say, no, I don't like that way. But uh, you need to write the rules for your own business and for your own life. So how's that happening now under these new guidelines, under the new way that companies are doing business? How's that shaping up? So the way this works, of course, is that a business model is defined by business rules. And you introduced me to the concept of business rules are what defines profitability in a company. And if you want to make more profit, you got to change your business rules. I love that idea. And it just blew my mind when you introduced that to me. So the, the business rules change into being everything a subscription. Everything possibly becomes a subscription. Now, keep in mind, a subscription doesn't necessarily mean month to month. You, it could be a three-year subscription that people are signing up for. It just happens to be that the revenues are broken into 36-month chunks. Well, that's not a bad thing. But on the other side is if you're used to selling a, a, an item for a transactional dollar and you're used to paying your sales team out of the – you know, they get their nick out of that, out of that 36 month purchase, boom up front. And you're chopping things into 36 month chunks. Where's the money to pay your sales team now? It disappears because it's now spread out over 36 months. Well, well you need, you need your, you need your finance, <clears throat> you need your finance guys to help figure that out. That's all. And, and if the business rules are organized in advance and you know, it's a 36 month deal, then, then the, the accountants and the financial people I uh, have to make arrangements for that. That might mean some financing in place. And yet from a finance standpoint, it's brilliant because bankers will loan you money if there's this consistent cash flow. Well, it's also, it's also secured by an invoice. Right on. I mean, that, that's what factoring is. I mean, you right know, really, I mean, they, you know, in a certain way, once you have a contract for 36 months or 12 months or anything, you can discount it at a bank and sell it. You know, there's receivables companies that do financing on those things. There's a lot of ways to unload that and to that, monetize it. That's true. Uh, absolutely true. The challenge becomes, though, that how do you pay a salesperson in that environment? Because hunters don't do well with small paychecks. They want big paychecks right up front. So you may have to change your business rules to how you pay your team or even how you structure your team. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm seeing is a transition. In fact, I'm recommending to a lot of my clients is this transition to an onboarding fee uh, at the beginning of your subscription. So there's an initiation fee. There's an assessment fee. There's a which, which is basically this, the guy's sales commission, right? That's, right that's on. Kind of, that's the sales commission. That's yeah. you got it exactly right. Yeah, that's what we pay our hunter. Hey, for. Listen, you know the, the old the old place. It was always the join a gym. Right on. You, it's a twenty, thirty, fifty, hundred dollars a month, whatever it was, and, and a two hundred dollar uh, initiation Membership. fee. That's it. That was the sales commission. That's exactly right. <laughs> the same same exact model. Yeah. Exactly yeah. the same. This model. this stuff is as old as the hills. Ain't that the truth? This has become very fashionable. It is. And so we have to make the adjustments to make it fashionable. Now, once you have your business models and business rules figured out, we implement that in IT. All IT these days is the implementation of business models. Yeah. And the idea here is that we can take our business rules and make sure they're enforced by the systems. And of course, we see that classically in the terms of fast food, where you go and you can only, menu, you can only order what's within the menu system. And the person who's taking the money can't give you money back without a manager override. Right. And so there's all these rules that we can build into controlling both the product, the service, and the cash flow and the reporting. And so the better we can imp- install our business rules into IT, the less acumen we need to operate a business. And- all, right, but, all right. Stop there for a second. Uh, you know, certain kinds of companies, McDonald's, fast food, other kinds of companies, uh, they tend to employ uh, lower level people, earlier stage people who are in their careers, people in high school or or whatever. You know, they don't have the same level of experience as uh, older people that start making more money. Um, is what you're saying that we have the ability to subsidize the intellect of earlier stage people? Or are you saying that we're kind of getting ready to wipe out the knowledge base of more sophisticated people too? The answer is yes to all of that. 
<laughs> All right, well, let's, we got to talk about how people are going to protect themselves because at some point in time, I mean, we talk a lot about how people have, have a burden of, of escalating their experience and their skill sets, but what you're bringing up is, is a little scary. So let's- Well, let's there's, there's two components of it. And what I'd like to do is talk about the first portion, which is a little less scary, then we'll talk about the scary part. All right. The less scary part is if you go buy a franchise, you're buying a set of a business model business rules and IT to implement those business rules. That's right. And even if you knew nothing about the business as the owner, but followed the IT business rules, you're going to be successful. So I don't, right. what that does is actually even removes the, the, the need for you as the owner of that company to have a high level of business acumen. Well, that's, that's the whole concept of a franchise. The whole concept right is somebody on. who's not a business person uh, can run a business, uh, you know, kind of paint by numbers. If you follow the instructions, uh, you know, it, it kind of happens. Right on. So, you know, it's not highly creative, but, but it's a machine. And remember, ma businesses are machines that generate money. That's right. So if you follow the rules, you do the same pattern over and over, and you do the systems over and over again, the machine's going to generate money. So it's not a creative process all the time, but it's execution a execution process. It works. Right. Execution process. Yes. So that's one example of how we do business models and the impact on the acumen of the team, right? That part is actually pretty good. The scary part is that traditionally highly paid people are doing things that are not well implemented in software, such as a doctor, a lawyer, an architect, an engineer. These people that are creating intellectual property or solving extremely complex problems. Well, here's the challenge. AI is about to codify a lot of that. In fact, you've probably seen the, the studies where oncologists are being out um, diagnosed by AI, by IBM well, you know, Watson. Some, but that's, but that's uh, listen, I'm not a doctor, but that sounds kind of formulaic. And computers are really good at formulaic kinds of things where they, where they take in a lot of different facts and circumstances right on. And, and then apply that to a model. That's, that's what computers are good at. That's right. Yeah. And the same thing has happened for decades in the world of engineering where we can drop a, a, a circuit into the computer and it'll will simulate it every way to Sunday. But on the other side, you know, it's not it, the, the part that the AI won't do well for a very long time and very long is probably within our lifespan uh, is be creative. And so if we want to survive these rapidly changing business models, you have to learn how to think beyond today. In fact, what we have to do is invent a future that doesn't exist using methods that have not yet been invented if you want to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah. That means stop getting stuck in the how and start thinking about the what and why. And that is what generates extraordinary value today and a lot, attracts a hell of a lot of money. Well, you know, listen, I would, I would imagine that a lot of leaders just aren't sensitive to that requirement just yet. I mean, they're probably not paying a lot of attention to it, which they is, aren't. I think you've articulated it very well. What got us here won't get us there. Nope. And we have to think about some things. Legacy thinking uh, isn't going to get the job done. No. We have to think about things in a new way. But how many leaders are really on top of that? How many leaders themselves are creative enough to even be open to the kinds of ideas that guys like us would put on the table? Well, and that, that's the reason why people have to die. <laughs> I hate to say it, but... You know, the reality is that if you have a leader that's approaching the end of their career, they're not going to do anything radical in the last three to five years. Yeah. It, they want to end on a high note. And so what ends up happening is they run their business out of business. And if you, if you think about this, the Fortune 500 turns over 50% of its population every 10 years. Yeah. Big companies aren't immune to this. You know, the Fortune 500 I, I guess turns over every, I mean, that's a, that should blow your mind. It, it is, it is mind boggling. Uh, you wouldn't think so, but you know, with all the mergers and acquisitions and other kinds of activity that exists, uh, you know, consolidations, I mean, there's one company buys another company I and mean, there's a lot of different reasons that that happens. It's not that they go out of business, but they get absorbed, they're, they're transitioned, different things happen. No, but the, but the no, other I, side to look at this is what drives mergers and acquisitions? The eat the strong, eat the weak. <laughs> yeah, well, that, listen, that's, uh, unfortunately, that's kind of Wall Street talk, man. You're, you're talking, uh, you know, it's very animalistic. Uh, it's Charles Darwin, really. Yeah, absolutely Darwinian. Yeah. Another, another example of this, though, Joel, is if you take a look at the original Dow Jones Industrial Average participants, there's only one left on the list. at and about, Nope. Who? GE. Uh, and they're about to be delisted off, off the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Right. No kidding, right? 
Wow. So e this this is the this is the impact of the inability to execute innovation, and that's the. Let thing me let me ask us. you about. Uh, I, I think AT and T is a fascinating company. You know they they have uh, they got they got deregulated. They got the, they turned into baby bills, and 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 they keep getting kicked out of this and that. And they keep getting uh, pushed away, and next thing you know, they come back, and now they own cell phones, and now they own internet, and now they own. I mean, I mean what's up with that? I mean, I something. Is they got some smart people there. They got something going on that's extraordinary. Well, first of all, you know, you can't go wrong working for AT&T as an engineer. You know, at and Bell Labs was always the premier job until Hewlett Packard came into play. And, you know, they're definitely the top, they, they attract top talent because they pay people well and they give them a lot of money and they let them do really creative, cool stuff. The thing that has driven AT&T more than anybody else is long-term thinking. When you're stringing cables 3,000 miles across the continent, you have to be thinking in terms of decades, not weeks. Yeah. And, and most of the folks on the planet are not good at looking out into the distant future. And as you taught me, the concept of hedging is have a long game and figure out how to make money today. Yeah. AT&T has mastered that strategy they they just they they consistently amaze me that they are still around every time you think they get knocked down they come back stronger they're an amazing company from that perspective and it's because they view the long game as yeah. what we must do you know sometimes they'll make an investment for example bearing fiber optic and the people are going what the hell are you doing two-thirds of the fibers that you're burying aren't even lit up <laughs> they're going i know but we know Metcalf's law, we know Moore's law, we know every one of those bad boys will be lit up and nobody else is going to have it in there. So we can actually charge way more yeah, yeah. than anybody else. And so they're looking, they're using the tools of forecasting technology. And now, of course, with 5G cell coming online in the next couple of years, the need for more fiber is going to be through the roof because... Uh, 5G essentially increases the available bandwidth by a factor of 100. Well, and, and, and us consumers, we want faster and more all the time. We just right keep on. wanting more, and it's getting worse and worse. I mean, uh, there's more video. Or better and better, depending on which side of the check you're oh. on. <laughs> <laughs> or better and better, for sure. No doubt about it. So, so tell me about, um, so you're saying that IT implements the business rules. The business rules are a function of the business model. Right. Business models are changing, and we need to be sensitive to this stuff. Yes. Let's talk about the people. Okay, let's wind this down. We only have a little bit of time left. From the perspective of the people, you know, I, I always caution people that they need to be uh, up in the ante on their game right so that Peter doesn't nip at their heels and take them down. Right on. What do you tell people that they need to be doing to be disruption-proof? The way you become disruption-proof is very, very simple. It's sample widely for hours every day. What does that mean? What that means is take two hours out of every day and read a broad cross spectrum of information. The, the way we invent is by stitching together things that we didn't consider to be adjacent and bringing those together. So I spend time every day looking at politics and technology and psychology. And I take a look at sales methodologies and business models. And I sample extremely widely. And you have to become a generalist about the world so you can become a specialist about what you're going to bring to the party. Yeah. And, you know, our conversation here is really built out of this lots of conversations, lots of curiosity. So yeah. if I boiled it down, I'd say I, I call it systematic curiosity. All right, listen, you, you and I have spent hours and hours in person, uh, you know, sitting together, brainstorming, arguing about ideas, favorite, debating. You're one of my favorite people to, to, to have and, conversations. And, yeah, and we've done this a lot, and we know each other, and, and we've gone back and forth, and we're both very progressive, thought leader kind of people. But, you know, most people are not. You know, if you work, uh, you know, in a... Uh, They're not listening to this job. podcast, pal. What's that? Those people are not listening to this podcast. I, I, I understand that. This podcast what, is but, part of our sampling strategy. Okay, right. And, and listen, this is, this is mostly for executives and people that are making big decisions that really need to have thought leader people in their life and they want ideas that are new and interesting. But right. what about regular people? How do regular people protect themselves? They're kind of counting on their boss to protect them, but the boss isn't really on their <laughs> side necessarily. <laughs> I mean, how do they protect themselves? I'm just looking out. I'm just asking about regular old folks. Yeah, that, that's a real cha interesting challenge because regular old folks are stuck in stasis by the people they surround themselves with. You know, 
Jim Rome's pointed out that we are the, the average of the five people we hang out with. Yeah, so all five people are there. Let's say they're all the same. They don't read those magazines. They're not thinking about these issues. They're thinking about getting their check next week and they go back right. to work the week after and then they got a little vacation coming up and they kind of live very, uh, very, you know, easy. Uh, you know, they just Unchallenged. simple. Okay, you know, so fine. So, uh, you know, listen, the people that we're uh, associated with, uh, they're scratching the wall all the time thinking about these issues. They are. And and guys right. like and us they, can help and them and, and we can be involved with them. But what about regular folks? I mean, what do, what do they do? How do they how do they get to the next level? How do they go from having a menial job that's about to replace them to being a, a little bit ahead of the computer and the, the other guys that are going to get replaced? The same thing. They have to have curiosity and they have to up-level their friends. And the thing is, is that, here's the thing, is that we're driving down the road on the highway and what do we call the person who's going slower than we are? Slowpoke. A slowpoke, a moron. And what do, they call, what do we call a person that's going faster than us? <laughs> An idiot, right? <laughs> and it's exactly the same thing with our own personal development. We hang out with people, and if they're going slower than us, we go, you know, you're a moron. And if they're going fast, what are you, what are you working so hard for, you idiot? <laughs> it's yeah. a really good metaphor yeah. for how we have to change the people we hang with. Well, let, let me, let me just remind you that this United States of America – got where it got because there were people that challenged the status quo, that pushed forward, that took risk. And it sounds to me, we got to wind this down right now, but it sounds to me like that's exactly the formula we need to implement right now is people need to get out ahead of the curve. They need to uh, be thinking different, be right curious, on. and they need to take some initiative that maybe they're not taking right now. So Mark, right you just give us some, uh, give us some contact info. And, and I want to say thank you for being with us. Oh, a real delight as always. Best way to get a hold of me is marks on linkedin.com. That'll take you right to my marks uh, on linkedin.com. Well, we'll, um, we'll put that on the website. People can find you. Yep. They'll be delighted to contact with you. There's over a hundred articles up there, access to a lot of information. And it's a great way to start a conversation. And you've got your own podcast. What's the name of the podcast? Selling disruption show.com. Yeah. And that's, Selling. it's awesome. It, it's an awesome show. You're a great host. So Thank listen, you. Mark, thanks very much for being part of it. And uh, for a, a, an awesome conversation today. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. You've been listening to profit from the inside with Joel block for more insights and to learn more, visit joelblock.com. <laughs>